So it's going to be a combination of a little bit of education for the partner and client base. In addition to that, describing and digging into our configurability, as well as customized projects projects, and what you can do to get ready uh, for these projects as uh, they come along from your end. And we also want to talk a little bit about expectation setting and what that looks like moving forward. We have some uh, really exciting new kind of processes and internal systems and controls in place to make sure that we can do our best to set expectations as well as deliver um, you know, adequate and well-performing product in a timely manner. So if you want to proceed, Sarah, thank you to the next slide. Uh, so I imagine quite a few of you already might uh, know me. Uh, if not, my name is Jamal Teklo. I'm the manager of account management here at EMHware. Uh, a pleasure to be speaking with you today and looking forward to having many more conversations with you. I joined EMH where mid last year to take over the account management function. And we're really uh, trying to set a new cadence and a new tempo and new expectations around what partner engagement means and how we can do better to serve all of you and each of you in your respective HSPs and agencies. And You'll probably be hearing uh, quite a bit more from me if you haven't already, definitely over the next few months. And I'll throw over to Sarah uh, to introduce herself. Thanks, Jamal. Hi there, I'm Sarah Alali, pronouns she, hers, and I come to EMH where started uh, back in October, so also relatively new, um, coming from Rogers Behavioral Health in um, Wisconsin, in the US. So um, my role as a product owner is, is really to kind of take all of our client engagement channels and translate that into product requirements and priorities and really kind of define a roadmap for EMHware to be able to kind of show you where we're headed. Um, one of my values is transparency, and I know that um, client engagement as well as, um, as testing and partnerships are concerned is um, something that we hear from you we could do a better job at. So um, this is a relatively new role with EMHWare as well. Uh, so we're working on a lot of process improvement, Jamal and I, internally. And we hope that you'll be able to reap the benefits of that through a better working product and much better um, communication over time as well. So I'll be working closely with Jamal to kind of set up, set up these kind of cyclical engagements to be able to gather feedback and um, give you the opportunity to see what we're designing earlier on in the process. So. I really appreciate your partnership, Jamal, and I'll kick it back over to you to talk about what we'll be talking about today. For sure. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Uh, a few housekeeping items before I go through the agenda. So we got a bit of content to cover today, but we programmed today to make sure that there was uh, enough time to answer questions that you may have. I would recommend that you refer to either the chat or the Q&A feature within Zoom to make some questions uh, or to write out some questions and we'll be able to address them towards the end of the webinar. So, okay, to kick off, we're gonna start uh, with the basics. And we're going to take you all to a little place we like to call EMR 101. And we're going to be discussing the difference between different EMR solutions. And from there, we're going to drill down into a little bit about EMHware and why we're a bit different and how the whole entire EMHware configurability setup uh, really works and what it does mean for you. We're then going to go into a little bit about custom development projects. Uh, and then we're going to Finally, talk a little bit about feature requests and custom projects. We've received a lot of uh, comments, questions about really what's the difference between a feature request and a project? And what does that mean for you? And what does that mean for us? So we're going to clear the air in that regard. And we're excited to do so. We're then going to talk a little bit about getting ready for custom projects, what you need to know, setting expectations for custom projects, and then gathering requirements and best practices for that. And Sarah will be uh, walking you through the whole process and then we'll dive into that Q&A discussion. So, kicking off. 
EMR 101. All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to describe three principal types of EMRs, and we're going to begin with the large enterprise EMRs, the one-size-fits-all approach. And these are normally featured in large organizations, many of which that are clinical in nature. So with each of these EMR types, we're also going to go through some pros and cons. Uh, so some pros. You basically know what you're getting. These are large systems, fairly standardized. You, what you see is effectively what you get. Uh, they have standardized processes and systems, and they're quite scalable and be, can be replicated easily. And they typically do have sophisticated functionality. Now, on the cons, typically, they are a bit on the expensive side, and they're also normally accessible to larger organizations. And as you may know, uh, with an EMH where we're always trying to interact with organizations from a variety of different subsectors and sectors and a variety of different sizes. Uh, so large EMRs, though, they typically aren't able to play to the small and medium uh, organizational set. Of course, there are exceptions, and we are uh, just, you know, kind of referring to uh, the more kind of larger, common enterprise EMRs that are out there. They typically have little to no room to change the solution for your needs, and as mentioned, most are highly clinical in scope. Moving on, we have your customizable EMRs. So they're fully customized EMRs from the ground up for each organization's needs. Now, normally, organizations with significant financial resources can afford this solution. And there are some stories out there of uh, customizable solutions being brought into different types of agencies and organizations. And the financial resources piece also not only talks about one-time funding opportunities, but to be able to fully leverage these systems on an ongoing basis, they typically do require consistent funding over several operational cycles or fiscal years. So on the pros, they're fully customizable and they can be built for your organization's specific needs. Now with the cons, there are issues with scalability and stability. So, and that really digs into, you know, when you're customizing certain aspects of your EMR solution, and really it drills down into the third point here, it gets more complex over time. And these constant changes do impact how scalable your solution can be and how stable it can be in the short, medium, and even sometimes long term. And of course, as illustrated in the third point, uh, they typically do lead to a lot of change management concerns. As you continuously customize and change your EMR solution, you're going to have to go back and train some folks, update documentation, change workflows, et cetera. So that can, of course, increase admin burden, typically slow down deployment, and add a lot of kind of change management concerns. Uh, also, I should mention that in a lot of cases, organizations might not have the capacity to fully leverage and build the solution they need. And in parentheses, uh, like to say the whole entire idea of, you don't know what you don't know. So in essence, let's say you are an organization that is rolling out a new maybe residential program and you got a lot of funding coming in for it. Everyone's excited and you need to look at an EMR solution. Or let's say, you know, we're in the world of MHA PDS and that's coming down the pipe. You need to incorporate an EMR solution to be compliant with the MHA PDS. Whatever it may be or whatever the reason may be, you are going to, in this case, need an EMR solution. So if you're an organization that might not have a lot of experience working with this type of technology or these solutions, and all of a sudden you, you know, go to the marketplace and seek out a customizable solution, how do you actually know that you're going to be building an effective customizable solution that will satisfy your needs in the short, medium, and long term? So organizations that typically do have a lot of institutional knowledge or experience working with EMR tech are in a better position to be able to leverage customizable solutions. However, if you're not that far along on that continuum, there can be challenges there. 
so we just always like to it, it's important to flag and consider uh as you are going into the marketplace looking at different types of emr tech moving on third option and this is my favorite, but I might be a little bit biased here, are configurable EMRs. So these are tailor-made configurations for EMRs using standardized modules and functionality. And they're featured in all organizational sizes across different sectors and subsectors. So some of the pros, uh, they're scalable and stable. And configurability does allow for tailored functionality. And we see that with, and we'll talk a little bit more about EMHR and how it is a cuts or configurable solution, and how that works well for you. And I would say one of the kind of more neat pros is, especially within this type of technology, it does leverage learning from one partner or one entity for the benefit of all. And it's accessible to a wide variety of organizations across different sectors and subsectors and sizes. And I would say, you know, it's a bit of the best of both worlds situation from the enterprise and customizable solutions. Now, of course, you know, it isn't all uh, rainbows and roses regarding configurable solutions. There are some cons here. So it might not be as customizable as you want. And some configurable pieces or learnings may not be what your organization or program needs. And this is something that we encounter all the time. And this is something that we're consistently working on and kind of pushing the boundaries on. How far can we extend EMHware, or in our case, EMHware, as a solution for different types of organizations? And I would say that this is something that is, you know, quite advantageous for not only us, but as well organizations are able to leverage our tech. Uh, however, this is also a concern for some organizations may and i'm sure we've all been there an update rolls out and then maybe you're not able to fully leverage that particular feature update because it was meant for let's say a different sector or subsector so again not all rainbows and roses but we do feel that uh as a configurable solution emhware is really uh a strong place to go for your aml for your emr solution so Here's, I like pictures, I like show and tell, and I also like using examples, so metaphor, analogy, or simile, depending on the context, to really kind of hit the point home and to help us encode this information. So, you know, moving on, think of an enterprise solution as a pre-made dollhouse. So you go to your local antique shop or you go to your local toy store and you wanna buy a dollhouse for somebody and it comes let's say even sometimes even pre-built, but with all the pre-made parts you need, you assemble it, what you see is what you get. They build and ship out a ton of these across stores all across the world, but you're not gonna see too much uh, ability to be able to customize. Again, with the pre-made dollhouse, that's what you're buying, and we hope that presumably the children in your household are gonna enjoy it. And on the flip side, with customizable, think of your modeling clay, your plasticine, Sure, you can build a house, but you gotta you gotta dig in there. You gotta build and mold, and you have to also ensure that although you do have the power to be able to build something that is quite remarkable and quite artistic, uh, I would say that I don't know. If, I can't speak for all of you, but my modeling clay uh, uh, skills are more in line with this picture here. So. Uh, when you do come up with a customizable solution, it's really up to you as well as the solutions team to really build something that's built to last. But again, when we talk about scalability and stability, this is where the model and clay also comes into play. Lastly, we got configurable. So let's look at some construction blocks. I don't know if we have any fans of this ty these types of toys in the house. I have a one-year-old. He is currently getting really excited to delve into these. And with a configurable solution, you got pre-made blocks and you're able to build and attach onto one another. So again, just wanted to kind of provide this example and this visual aid to really hit the point home in terms of what we mean between these three types of solutions. So, EMHware is configurable. So what? Since EMHware is a configurable solution, 
you can have the functionality turned on or turned off depending on the function that you're looking for. And over here at EMH, where a lot of our functionality is either baked into the core uh, software enterprise license or through additional modules. And partners leverage a collective intelligence of the entire EMHR partner base where we can best practice and update products accordingly or update the product accordingly. So yeah, we get lots of uh, suggestions, feature requests, and as well feedback from a wide variety of different partners about a wide variety of different functionality. We're able to go through that, parse it out, and analyze and assess what's beneficial for all, and we're able to push that out into the solution for everyone to enjoy. There also is an ability to engage in customization through case data forms, custom reports, and custom dev projects. So let's dig into a little bit about custom dev projects. It's one of the reasons why we're here today. So custom development projects are special requests made by partners to create specific functionality for your EMHR instance. They can be custom reports, case data forms, or even the development of whole new modules. So custom dev projects use a combination of development, product, support, and client success teams, team resources to implement. So typically when we look at a custom dev project it is cross-functional with an EMH where we're, as a lot of folks like to say, including us, we're a small but mighty team and we're satisfying over 200 partners. Uh, I think we actually are around 250 partners in some change now. Uh, so yeah, typically when we look at custom dev projects, it's a little bit of a full core press effort from everyone here. And we're of course happy to do so. And we should mention that custom dev projects are available for a fee uh, along with the statement of work. And we'll be discussing that a little bit later. Okay, now. One of the most common questions I get when I'm chatting with all of you lovely partner folk, custom development and feature requests. What's the difference? So let's clear the air right now. So feature requests. These are enhancements suggested by partners. And this is normally done through Zendesk. Sometimes it's done through email or even on uh, calls with uh, partners. They provide incremental improvements to current functions or modules. And feature requests have led to a lot of improvements to EMHR over the years. So the big pro for partners is that they're free. They don't hit your wallet. Con, though, is there can be long wait times, and we can't get to all feature requests. And this is something I do really want to impress and set expectations on uh, with all of you. We get a lot of feature requests. Uh, we receive... Uh, I would love to report back with some numbers, but I can say it's a lot to the point where we do even have a significant backlog. And sometimes it is hard for us to be able to keep up with these feature requests. <laughs> Pardon the fireworks. Definitely got to turn that off on my, uh, on my Mac. However, I am pretty excited to speak about feature requests, so I'll roll with it. And this is something that is a constant kind of tension and push and pull within, with us internally. We are trying to increase our capacity and our ability to be able to review and triage future requests. And we also need to understand that individually and collectively due to the nature of future requests, we won't be able to tackle or implement all of them uh, just due to the sheer volume that we get. So what we try to do uh, is we try to review, triage, and see what would be the most beneficial for our partners. And of course, addressing feature requests that really do have a big upswing, let's say, in functionality or value. And then we have custom dev. So custom dev can be requested through support or now through interactions with your dedicated account manager. So they can provide incremental or even transformative improvement to current functions or modules. So the pro for partners is that a custom development request enables EMHR functionality to be more aligned with your organization and your programs. And I would say that they, oh, the main con is, of course, their fee for service. And they do hit your wallet a bit. So when it comes to determining whether something is a feature request or a custom dev, that's done through a combination of us looking at um, the nature of the request, as well as a consultative approach with you and our partners.
Okay. Moving on. And this is going to be my last side for a bit. Don't worry. I know you're all probably a little bit tired of hearing me talk. I'll be handing it off to Sarah momentarily. <laughs> so getting ready for custom dab projects, what you need to know. So you want to get in touch with your account manager and we have a new dedicated uh, email accounts at amhware.com. Feel free to make a note of that. And we can also make a note of that in the chat. Or of course, you know, you can kick it old school and go through support support at umhware.ca to inquire about getting a custom dev project up and going. I would also recommend that you copy, if you decide to go through Zendesk, copy your dedicated AM, so Sab or myself or Sam in limited cases to ensure that we have eyes on the request. And a little bit of a pro tip, try to have your requirements ready, articulating what you'd like to have built, and we will work with you to firm this up. And we'll also create a statement of work which will contain details about the project, a development schedule, timelines, costs and estimates, and a detailed breakdown of the planned work. So this SOW process is something that we've been committing to over the last little bit, and it is uh, an admin lift for sure. Uh, however, it's something that we're really committed to. We do want to increase our capability in being able to provide uh, proper service as well as transparency and clarity about the nature of this work, tying it to timelines, tying it to warranty periods, and ensuring that we're able to uh, adequately deliver the work that you are tasking us to build. So last point I want to make here, this is an important one, perk up if you haven't been perking up already. Only have a limited amount of development hours. I know they're not infinite. Who knew? And we can only attach a certain amount of development hours to custom projects. So first come, first serve. So I want to elaborate a little bit on this. And what do I mean by that? So our dev team is always working on a ton of stuff. They're addressing your bugs. They're addressing different tasks. They're addressing custom dev projects, feature requests. They're working a lot all the time they do impressive work especially given the size that they're working at now we only have a certain amount of custom development hours that we can attach uh per sprint as we call them so if you want to get in on a custom dev project we always like to say first come first serve and we'll try to slot you in but we'll of course work with you through the sow process to ensure that uh timelines are mutually agreed upon between you, the partner, and us, of course, the producer and provider of this work. Okay. Now, I'm going to not talk for a little while, have a swig of coffee and maybe some water, and hand it off to Sarah to talk a little bit about preparing your request. Take it away. Thanks, Jamal. So I am going to cover the requirements gathering phase for each of these custom um, custom development projects. Most custom de dev projects do fall under one of these buckets here. And I tried to indicate generally what size they typically fall under. Um, so we've got your smaller, smaller requests related to changing fields in the client file for report, reporting, excuse me. Um, and then, of course, we sometimes have custom reports. So those can be small to medium changes with uh, about two to four week turnaround time. And we can accommodate those. Um, we can accommodate a number of those per sprint. Um, custom prints are also typically small to medium. Sometimes, um, sometimes it's just modifications or copying an existing printout that we, um, that we can convert or update for you. And then we get into the large and the extra large buckets of work. So um, integrations are something I'll talk a little more about as well as new workflows or features within EMHware. So I'll go into a, li a little more detail about essentially best practices for gathering those requirements up front. Um, the value here about uh, a quality request, initial request is that we can take action on a well-defined request so much more quickly than, um, than something that doesn't have exactly um, what we need. 
sometimes we get more than we need for something that ultimately is relatively simple. And that can bog down the team and kind of add complexity or confusion to something that could be relatively straightforward. And any complexity, um, if, if you think of your request as a widget that's throw it, flowing through our business processes, any added complexity can kind of hold the widget up throughout the various steps in our process. So, um, so being concise, of course, is very helpful just at a high level. But then we'll also talk about with integrations and entirely new features, um, we don't necessarily need the technical answers right away. Um, you don't have to come to us with a solution. We'd like to partner with you in designing that solution. So I'll speak a little more about requests that don't necessarily fit neatly in the current EMHware system shortly. Um, so, so the first smallest and maybe easiest thing to cover is the um, changes to fields that you need for reportability's sake. So um, here's an example of a case data and you can see the various um, field types. Um, essentially, when you're making a request to change a field, you can choose to either change the case, ch make a change in ca a case data form or the client's data set. So the difference there is that case data is typically gonna fall under that category of changeable over the course of the client's encounter. So um, modifiable suicide risk factors, for example. Whereas fields added to the client's data set are going to be more enduring in nature and tends to include information like demographics that is typically going to remain unchanged over the course of the client's encounter. Uh, the great news here is that you can simply email support at EMHware to add or modify case data or data set um, fields free of charge. So the key there really is to just send them an email with exactly the field that you'd like modified or added or removed. And if you're looking to add a new field, we need to know what type of field you like. So um, again, on this screenshot, we've got these uh, checkbox, checkbox options, repeatable string fields, long string fields, whether or not they should be required, etc. So if you're able to just simply um, simply identify the content and the type of field that you need and where you'd like it put, the data set or a case data form, and you email support at EMH where they can typically turn those requests around in a couple business days. Um, so don't ever hesitate to, to pull that lever should you need. Um, and then we'll talk about reportability of these data changes. So we do have an existing, um, an existing report that is simply called the case data extract in column format, which is going to be, which is going to give you all of the fields in a case data set per column. So if that is all you need for reporting, support is gonna be able to help you out there and it will be of no cost to you. So that's kind of one of these elements of configuration that you're able to leverage without additional cost. Um, if the case data, if the case data data extract in column format is not gonna meet your needs, perhaps we need to discuss a custom report. And that's where we kind of enter into um, the fee-for-service here. So I realize this list is a list of existing EMHWare reports, but it's a good representation of the information that we need to be able to generate a design of a, your custom report. Essentially, what we need to know are what columns you would like to see and the source of the data 
Um, so is it in a case data form? Is it in the data set? Is there another way of capturing this information, et cetera? Um, and then we have the parameters. So what kind of filters would you like to be able to use to get that query nailed down in a way that gives you just the information you need? And, the, and of course, the name of the report. So, um, so that's, those are kind of the basics of a report request. If you're requesting a custom report, it's very helpful if you tell us if you're already using an existing report to get most of your information. That gives us a building block to start from. And again, we can turn your requests around much more quickly if you have an idea of the reports that you're currently using to get the information. Another thing of note is if there are additional calculations or some kind of summary view that you're looking to have added to your custom report, it does add complexity and it will increase the turnaround time of your custom report request. I'll also um, add a caveat here, however, we're continuing to iterate on the EMHWare analytics module and our future vision, so future meaning it's not ready yet, but our future vision for this really is to enable more self-service reporting over time. So you're not having to wait on EMHWare to deliver up the data that, that you need. All right, so then um, our next topic here is custom prints, which is pretty straightforward. We offer logos and branding. We can auto-populate fields for you if you're already documenting in EMHWare. We can add static content for things like a letter to primary care physician as an example of one we recently did. And then um, signature lines. So that one's pretty straightforward. Um, it's certainly helpful to have some visual aids for this one if you have a good example of a document that you, that you would like to use. Now we get into the, the, what I feel is the more exciting work that we do, um, which is kind of truly solving business problems, right? So um, the, the next bucket of, um, of development work that we like to do with our partners are the integration. So um, each EMHware is growing more efficient with our ability to integrate with external systems and interoperability is a uh, a primary aim overall of EMHWare. It's, it's a value that we all hold um, to improve public health and our delivery of care to the community. And, um, and it's something we see a lot of opportunity with EMHWare that, that we can do better here. So over the last few months, we've built out multiple integrations for things like referrals and looking ahead, we're trying to see how we can promote interoperability for integrations with other community partners even. Um, some ideas we've talked about are food banks, school boards, and perhaps even law enforcement in the future. Of course, in a PHIPAA compliant fashion. So we have to be very careful about the security of these integrations. Um, and we, need to do a lot of testing. So that's the note that I have here. We'll be partnering with you all closely for the design and validation of our integration setups, especially in kind of early in our journey with integration. So previously we could do about two to three integrations per year, but we're currently, in, we're laying the groundwork to enable API integrations. If they are using HL7 or FHIR standards, we should be able to accommodate about 10 new integrations annually. So um, that's kind of what we're looking at over the next 12 months, but we do iter iteratively improve and grow more efficient with each and every integration. So we'll be able to accommodate more requests than 10 per year um, perhaps in, a, in six months, we may be ready to start 
accommodating that more frequently. So just to give you an idea of our, our current bandwidth given our finite resources. And the last thing I wanted to touch on are these kind of new workflows or features. Um, there, as, as Jamal was saying earlier, our configurability allows us to take the knowledge of our partner base and, and allow that to benefit the design of the core product. Um, however, if we go chasing every business process with an EFHware solution, it will detract us from our focus, which is really continuing to um, promote interoperability and empower the, the continuum of care for our community. So um, we have to be mindful about what what projects we're able to engage in. Um, as you saw earlier, these are the extra large, <laughs> um, the extra large projects. And we, um, at, at this time, if we do have something reaching that scope, we can probably accommodate three to four in a year, given our resource, our finite resources today. So um, we do have to be methodical about the projects we're choosing to engage in. Uh, but we'll get down here to the gathering requirements. That's, that's my, um, my purpose for today is really to help, help you understand how you can deliver a, a well-formulated request that might improve the odds of our ability to partner on that request. So, um, so gathering requirements, we don't expect them to be too technical in nature. In fact, with these larger projects, we'd ideally not ask you to waste your time getting technical at all. <laughs> we want to understand your business problem in plain language and partner together to design a creative solution. So um, every element of documentation in EMHware should correspond to a step in your business process. So in order to develop a new workflow or feature specific to the business process that doesn't currently fit in EMHware very neatly today, we need to do a deep dive as your partner into the business process that you're looking to document in EMHware. So for the initial requirements, it's actually really helpful to, I know it looks kind of silly, this person with the post-it notes, but it is really helpful, even if it's something very, very basic, like a few post-it notes, um, to understand your process map that visualizes the who and the how of your day-to-day -day process. So as I was describing these requests as widgets that move through our business processes, that's how we have to visualize the data in EMHware moving through your business processes. And um, we are the technical experts. We can design, we can de design technology solutions, but you're the expert of your business. So that's the information that we would like to hear from you about is your business. Um, with that, we also want to be able to measure the success of the design. So we're going to start asking questions during initial scoping calls about what business KPIs that you expect to impact with the EMHware improvement. Uh, this will be a part of the initial discussion and we'll, we'll be using these empirical methods to make sure that we're designing something with you that will actually impact your business instead of, um, you know, just delivering a solution and running away from it. So we would like to partner with you, understand what it is we can measure or help you measure with EMHware to ensure the success of our design. Um, and then finally, if if as we seek to be more transparent with our clients, we also appre appreciate your transparency with us about what you've maybe tried in the past to solve this particular business problem and any learnings from those past attempts that will be helpful to us as your partners to ensure that history doesn't repeat itself. 
so if this is something that you're interested in doing, as I said, we do have to be very intentional about the projects that we engage over the next year. And, um, and as we improve our processes, we hope to be able to engage in these types of projects more frequently. But if you are interested in, um, in working on something like this, talk to your account manager and they'll schedule a scoping call to discuss these items and determine the feasibility based on our resources. So the last sentiment I will kind of leave you all with is the fact that custom dev projects can seem intimidating or large and time intensive, and they certainly are at times, um, but we do hope to partner with you and produce solutions that generate simplicity in your processes, as well as continuously improve our processes to, you know, be, be better partners. Um, continuously, so we're never satisfied. Um, and and we'll, you'll be working with the same people on this call probably at some point on your project, um, so we're here to help you step-by-step. Uh, step. Jamal, any closing thoughts? No, no, Sarah, uh, totally, yeah, thanks for that piece, and I think, um, yeah, given time, I do want to hop into Q&A, and we do have a question that I think actually is very much in tandem with what you were just discussing about how we consult and how we intend to move forward there. So the question is, can you describe your consultation process with custom dev projects? For example, if there is a custom dev project that impacts more than just the requesting agency or other partners consulted? Uh, I can take first crack at this one. I think one thing we need to be mindful of is the scale of the project and the size. So as Sarah presented, we do have multiple custom project sizes. So something along the lines of, let's say, a small to medium size uh, project, let's say like a case data form, for example, um, or a custom report, we might be doing that on a partner agency specific cadence. Now, when we're talking about the large projects, uh, such as new workflow features or integrations, we're already underway in terms of working with multiple partners and bringing them to the table. And we're actually doing this a lot with our integration work. And we do strive to improve upon that kind of process. So as Sarah was talking about our in-depth partnership and discovery phase, we can definitely bring different partners into the conversation if there is a similar, let's say, request relating to similar functionality. And I think that's definitely something that we do want to explore more. We, that is also something we hope to flush out naturally through our new uh, COP approach, our new community of practice approach and strategy that we plan to roll out all throughout 2024. Uh, anything to add there, Sarah? I'll also add um, my position is a new one with EMHware, and so um, that's, that's kind of my role is going to be supporting these communities of practice and also finding ways to, again, improve our business processes that allow, that you all will interact with over time. So um, a couple things that we expect to be able to deliver in the future include, um, like a, a roadmap that you can in, interact with online. So you can give feedback, you can upvote ideas, you can drop comments about, um, about these types of features that will impact the core product. And then for other um, more operationally specific projects that might be specific to only one subsector, for example, um, that's where we would try to spin up the communities of practice in order to have focus groups that have a variety of representation within those subsectors. Um, another thing that, that we're looking to do is offer more interactive engagement through, throughout the development cycle through the use of, um, 
through the use of various other technology products, frankly, um, to be able to, you know, show you videos and um, screenshots to get kind of the, to get your feedback during the prototype and idea ideation phase before it's even built out. Um, and finally, I do also acknowledge that we need to do better at allowing our partners to get their hands on something, feel it, give, you know, feel it, play with it, not to be like the molding or the modeling clay, but in this case, like pick your Legos apart. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is not sponsored by Lego, by the way. <laughs> um, but I, I know that we, um, we need to do better there. And there's still some more complex problem solving that I don't have the answer for you yet, but your voices have been heard and it is a pri priority of mine in my role to build, um, build those feedback loops. So we are, we're, you'll hear more about that over time. And these webinars are, also, as you can see, our technical difficulties at the beginning here, it's something we're kind of, Jamal and I are kind of new to with EMHware, and I see this as another forum to, um, to leverage for, for the product-specific feedback. So I'll Perfect. also stop talking in case anyone else has a question. Or yeah, uh, we don't have any other questions. Feel free to use the chat or the Q&A feature if you do. Um, until that populates, I'll just say one of the things I'm personally excited about, the idea of kind of the crowdsourcing of product feature uh, requests or, if you will, uh, product ideas on the roadmap. I think that's uh, really cool. And it also provides not only that interactivity, but also that transparency in terms of, hey, this is what we're going to want to pursue because all of you wonderful folks out there in EMH or land have uh, requested it in a popular manner. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. So with that, I think we can more than likely adjourn. Um, I will say that, of course, uh, do feel free to reach out with any questions or, or concerns that you may have. Feel free to reach out to support at emhware.ca or accounts at emhware.com. And it was a pleasure to be speaking with all of you today. We are getting into March Madness webinar season, as I discussed at the top of the call. So do feel free to register for as many of those as you can. A lot of them are going to be running over noon hour on a variety of days all throughout March. So we hope to see you out on all those. And of course, you'll have different EMHware personalities showing up depending on the nature of the call. So until then, it's been great speaking with all of you today. Oh, there we go. We got an 11th hour question. I love it. Uh, so could you throw more light on integration process? You want to feel that, sir, or you want me to? If if you have some ideas, feel free to go on ahead. Go on ahead. Yeah, uh, so I'll take first crack at this. So when it comes to integrations, uh, we need to be mindful of, well, one, uh, again, kind of referring to Sarah's uh, slide, they are complying to FHIR and HL7 standards. So FHIR in particular is a, di a data interoperability standard and framework that we're adhering to as we engage not only integration work, but all types of data interoperability work, uh, of course, in tandem with HIPAA compliance. So we do consistently want to strive towards providing value to all of you partners around integration. So we currently do have a few integrations available right now. Um, and that we are rolling out with partners. So that includes Greenspace, CareDov, Ocean, iCarol, as well as Amazon QuickSight that feeds into the analytics module. So we're consistently wanting to create 
as well as uh, OST that we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, throughout March. So we do want to consistently create more value for all of you in terms of integrations to cut down on double entry, to increase data efficacy and cleanliness, and to you know, minimize admin burden, because that's kind of the idea of integrations, right? Communicate or data is able to speak to another system and kind of go back and forth, uh, depending on the nature of the integration. So there are outgoing and incoming integrations, but also there are some integrations that are known as bi-directional. And that centers on data being pushed to an external system, or in our case, data being pulled into EMHware. And of course, bi-directional, pardon the thumbs up, uh, bi-directional integrations feature simultaneous data transferring between two different systems. And as Sarah mentioned, we're consistently on the lookout in terms of integration partners, uh, be they public, private, or even public-private partnerships. As Sarah mentioned, there are some, yeah, there are a, a lot of really neat systems out there uh, that work with a wide variety of different subsectors. As Sarah mentioned, there's food, some food bank-related integrations. There are also integrations relating to a bunch of assessments out there. And we're continuously looking at who we want to build integrations with. And of course, we're keeping in mind the nature of our partner base and our clientele. That's all of you to ensure that we uh, back the best horse, so to speak, uh, in terms of the types of integrations we choose to create. Thanks for that, Jamal. I sometimes balancing the technical speak with like, more straightforward language I sometimes can get in the weeds on the technical side so I would have answered a lot more technically than that. yeah and you're a product human so that makes total sense <laughs> I'm an AM human so I'm gonna try and go for more client facing and a little bit with a dash of technical so we balance <laughs> each other out it all works yes Okay, with that, we're a little bit over time. Thank you all, presumably, for spending your lunch hour with us. I hope you're going to keep on being nourished and hydrated and keep on getting along with your week.